Ryan here from Life Action Roleplay. So this is episode 50 of the podcast. I didn't expect that we would be here, but I'm glad that we are. Originally, Sin, Kai, and I were going to try to do something special, but trying to get all of us to meet together for over the summer is a bit of a challenge. So we're going to keep continuing um, from Kubulkan and... Uh, we are planning to do a live stream of a future episode with all three of us, and we're trying to coordinate that with the Scabby Rooster. So keep that in mind, and as soon as we know, we will let everybody know. I want to thank our Patreon supporters, uh, especially Ixnay, the Eyes of Petra, Talon Bowler, Fei Leung, Sam Sanchez, Vivid Vivka, Aaron Ludlow, and Twin Mask Larp. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to me so that I would be able to continue doing the podcast as well as Blank Slate. And without further ado, number 50, which is all about LARP and logistics, putting and putting on a LARP and finding a site to do it. So, playback. Welcome to Life Action Roleplay with Ryan Omega. I am here continuing the KubelCon series of podcasts I'm recording while I'm here over Memorial Day weekend. And uh, let me introduce my guests. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, I'm Ryan Galliata, longtime LARPer. Mm-hmm. Uh, been doing descriptive LARP like Vampire for <clears throat> oh, 20-some years. Uh, I also run the Bay Area Firefly Nerf LARP mm-hmm. and play in Kai's Dystopia Rising, or I like to call Zombie Camp. Zombie Camp. <laughs> what are we drinking today? Well, unfortunately, we had a, a short supply, so it's going to have to be what's important at cons? <laughs> hydration. So we're drinking water. Water. Water is always good. And shout outs. Do you have any shout outs you want to give? Um. Oh, wow. Uh, I, I was just saying how I listened to the show and I should be prepared, and I didn't have, not prepared for a shout-out. Um, I actually am going to give a shout-out to Warlock, a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've known him for years. He's the one that got me involved with Alliance and Active LARPing, but I really give him a shout-out because he runs the logistics for the Firefly LARP, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of pain. He takes care of the character sheets and stuff like that, and I never th- feel I thank him enough. So he gets a shout-out. Nice, nice. And I just met Warlock today and he was running a game of Fireball Island. Which is a fun classic. Yeah, fun classic. I didn't even know they rebooted it. And it was better than the original, from what I remember. But it was really nice for him and other people to hold down a table so that other people had the opportunity to play this game. So I also reconfirmed that shout out. Uh, my shout out is going to go to my dear friend Kaylee Bray, who you have maybe you heard us shut out between Kai Sin and myself because she is an amazing person. She is a guest of honor here at KubelCon and she's killing it. Like between doing di- dice damsels and everything nice and organizing D and D in a jet with Satine Phoenix and just being a guest at this con, like she is she works hard. She is a stunt woman and a D&D performer and a great singer and a great voice actress. So I want her to be in all the things. So my shout out to Keely Gray. Excellent. Yeah. And to, since, since we are both named Ryan. <laughs> to make things easy. To make we'll this... just call you Bruce. No. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to, I think we're just going to tag each other with last names, but there's only two of us, so yeah. this should be pretty easy. The topic for today is going to be logistics in LARP. And there are 
there are so many uh, ways to tackle So many this. different things to think about. Yeah. Um, I've come at this from a very physical sense of the logistics, mm-hmm. finding a place to play, which I've been doing, like, you know, I, I started LARPing in Chicago uh, back when One Roll by Night started. And for the Chicago game, I was the person that got us the places to play, which is really hard when you're trying to explain to, like, funeral homes and churches. Funeral homes? Yes. Okay, this... Okay. Keep going, but I want to know what this funeral... You asked a funeral home to play... Okay. I did a vampire LARP in a couple different funeral homes in Chicago. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. Now, Vampire LARP does have a little bit of advantage for getting sites like that because since it's all descriptive action, Mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to... You know, explain. Hey, we're doing interactive theater, mm-hmm. and you know it's kind of a horror theme, and you you can build it up as it lean into the theater side of things a lot. Mm-hmm. So when you're talking to these funeral homes, it's like, yeah, no, we're not going to be like a drunk funeral that will be a problem. We'll clean up after ourselves. It's all sober, and that's how I was able to get us in to a lot of different spaces. So you basically said we are not an Irish wake. <laughs> we can. We, we, we behave can, ourselves and we clean up after ourselves. Right. <laughs> wow. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about like One World by Night and kind of like the origins yeah. of, about that. Can you talk a little bit about oh, that? Oh, yeah. So One World by Night was the brainchild of Bill Hyatt, mm-hmm. who was a student at Purdue in Lafayette. Mm-hmm. And at the time, there was a... A troop game in Lafayette and a troop game in Chicago. I was in the, the Chicago game. Mm-hmm. And Bill, uh, the the storytellers between the two games got to meet and talk and stuff like that and wound up sharing a world. Mm-hmm. And so people could bring their characters back and forth. And Bill was one of those people, and he would stay with me and a bunch of other people. So I was like, I, I claim that One Roll by Night started in my living room. <laughs> but it was one of the you know logistics of sharing, you know, a storyteller team sharing the world with another storyteller team. Mm-hmm. And being that's where the whole uh, One World by Night cro- uh, Chronicle Sovereignty became the big issue. Mm-hmm. It's like, while everything happens in the world, you get to say what happens in Chicago, and we get to say what happens in Lafayette, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone, you know, that, that way we can share the world, but this is ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then as One World joined, got bigger, and Bill reached out to other people, you know, we added the, there was a San Francisco game that was already in play that joined us, and then the Brazil group. Oh, the Brazil group, there are several different cities in Brazil, and if I remember right at the time, they were uh, enough of a club activity they were sponsored by Coca Cola down there. Whoa, okay. This is new information to me for a game that I've played in a, for a very long time. Yeah. Wow. And. And so, like you, you, we get you get a lot of great pictures from Brazil because they have some, they have more production money, and that's. I mean, I don't know that that was back in the late '90s, early odds. Mm-hmm. The that because like you know, I had a couple friends of mine like Carrot who actually went from Chicago down to Brazil and and had a blast. It's like so envious. I did not even know Carrot went down there. Oh, hi, Carrot. Hi, Carrot. Hey, Carrot. I miss you. Miss you too. But the way it's, which is cool, but it's getting away from the logistical issues that we want to we want to focus on. I'm full of war stories. I apologize. No, that's okay. We often go into tangents, which is part of the magic of the podcast. <laughs> um, but we were talking about the different places where you attended intended to have your first LARPs for. Right. For your chronicle, and, and you said funeral homes. So we, yeah. I approached a few funeral homes, mm-hmm. and you know, one of the things is be ready for a rejection. You're not going to get the first person you talk to to get let you in, but you know, be kind, be professional, and you're able. You'll be able to approach people, and somebody will be like, "Well, we don't have anything. It's an empty space. Let's make some money off it," because mm-hmm. you know that we don't. They don't want empty space. Mm-hmm. Though the funeral homes did have a few problems. There were a few cases where we would get bumped because funerals happen on a short term than our planning. <laughs> Game is called and sick of someone actually died. Yes. <laughs> oh, 
And, and this wow. was and this was also like late nineties, early odds when we didn't have the same kind of strength of internet networking for people. Mm-hmm. So this was phone trees of like you know getting on the horn and calling people and letting people know that you know like alternate site, alternate site, we need to move. Oh my god! Okay, so now I have a couple of questions yeah. as a result <laughs> of uh, your. Uh, the things that you just pointed out. Yeah. Uh, one is, what do you look for in an ideal site? And then the second question, well, let's start with that one. Okay. So, um, the criteria I looked for for vampire spaces, or play, places to play vampire, is accessibility, mm-hmm. um, raw space, but nooks and crannies and rooms. You know, like, I don't want just one big warehouse. Mm-hmm. I can work with that if that's what's available, but ideally, I like a place that has maybe a large room and then a s- bunch of smaller rooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, uh, there's a dovetail, uh, oh, dovetail conservatory. I, I, I'm horrible right now. This is you know three days of con brain, mm-hmm. but uh, it's a, a loft space in San Francisco that we uh, that uh, they'll always come evening game played recently. Mm. And they have a central studio space, mm. and then this gorgeous library, some hallways that people can you know conspire in, and another kitchen. And so there's you know places that we can even have food, which is great. I wow. I look at food as an icing issue for LARP. It's nice to have, but it's not a requirement. Mm-hmm. And so like you know that that space, the dovetail space, you know there is an elevator, so everyone can get access to it. Um, not and. Not every space I can rent for games, uh, I am able to provide that access, and it's like, you know, like the Firefly LARP that I run, mm-hmm. uh, there's a huge stairway to get to it, and so I have a couple people that can't come pay, play to my game, but I get that place at such a deal that, and it's not like there's other places available that allow me to do an active LARP or a buffer LARP. Mm. The That's- other question that I wanted to ask was... So you mentioned that sometimes you lose a space and you mm-hmm. need to find another space or another alternate site. Right. So what do you do when you do have short-term notices like that that you have to turn around really, really quickly um, to find another space to play? That's that's a hustle. Uh, there have been – there was one site that we had uh, – actually, one of the funeral homes we had, we got bumped – Mm-hmm. And I had that was on a Friday. I mean, that was on a Monday, and the game was on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And I called around all the you know I, I kept a you know a list of places that we could, could play at and stuff like that. And I wound up getting a hold of a park district mansion on the lakefront in Chicago mm-hmm. in the summer. And I wound up going from oh crap, I have no place to I've got the best place I've ever had for a long time. I mean, it was like a three-floor mansion that was from uh, turn of the century, and I managed to get us in there in a week and get people to it. And we wound up being there for like three, four months, and it was just one of the most amazing sites. But it's hustle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more places I went to and the more positive experience we had with them, the more I could rely on them later when I'm in a pinch. So it's, you know, like I guess I would say is maintaining a professional relationship with all the places and making sure they are happy because mm-hmm. if they're happy, they'll let you back. I mean, you sound straight out like a location manager yes. in even Hollywood productions, but you're now doing this for LARP. Yes. Wow. I, for the Chicago Requiem game, I did that from probably like 96 until I moved out of Chicago in 04. Wow. And we played, like, in that whole time, there were two locations I did not organize that somebody else organized. Mm -hmm. From when we start, when we we first started, we were playing out in the street, just Belmont and Clark area downtown. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend of mine that had an apartment building that kept the basement space for, you know, underground goth parties. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, the place was already decked out goth style. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, she let us rent that for Saturdays, and we wound up playing there at uh, Scary Sarah's building, the thir- Scary Sarah Productions from Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we played there for months. Mm-hmm. And that's what got me started. 
It's like, I just happened to have a friend that had a space. The next thing I know, it's like, well, when we grew too big for that space, I'm starting calling around, and I think I've rented uh, function rooms from uh, churches. Mm-hmm. And again, coming in, like, you know, we're very clean, we're sober, we're just going to play our game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's theater, interactive theater, mm-hmm. you know, everyone is an audience, everyone's a player type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, you know, would approach schools. Uh, mm. There was a point when there was a group that started a Boffer and Nerf Shadowrun game mm-hmm. in Chicago, and we had, we got to use St. Gregory's High School on mm. a Saturday. Wow. That was amazing. <laughs> nice. I did not organize that one, but that was just another case of, you know, having connections and networking, and that's, you know, that's half talent and half hustle. Wow. And it sounds like it's part of the, it's kind of a storyteller's responsibility yeah. to put that uh, together, because unlike, say, playing a game of Dungeons & Dragons mm-hmm. or Pathfinder or any other tabletop game, you have the challenge of just finding a place where you're all playing as well as trying to figure out a day when all of your players are available but this is very very different because yeah. now you are dealing with a group of 10 20 30 sometimes 100 or more back back in the day in the late 90s like that mansion i talked about mm-hmm. uh we had 120 players regularly mm-hmm. wow oh, those are the days as I fanned myself from the you, flashback. You fan, you fan uh, yourself. Uh, oh, the vapors. Um, <laughs> so, so I did that for several years. Um, and then I got to a point where I talked to the storyteller staff. Because I actually was not a storyteller at that time. I was a player, but I was on staff for... I was basically... Site manager was my title. And my job mm-hmm. was... That's all I did. But I still got to play. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually went transitioning from renting from other people to renting a loft myself downtown. I used to live uh, Lake and Wells, downtown Chicago, in the Loop, and we had a 2,200-square-foot loft Mm -hmm. that I lived in, but we also ran vampire game and werewolf game. Mm -hmm. Pretty much we had six nights a month were game space. Wow. And also it gave me a chance to do more some other experimental games. Uh, a friend of mine, Jack Graham, and I did a short run of one-shot games like The Wedding of the Goblin King mm. and uh, Year of the Rat, 1938 Noir. Mm. And we did these fun little one-shot games because I had a space in my pocket, and that was beautiful for it. Mm. Uh, and, you know, like I had pe- roommates that lived there as well, but, you know, I'll admit that the game helped us pay a lot majority of the rent for the space. Mm. But then, you know, the ga- it was always available to game. Right. And we had, like, our, our personal rooms were off balance, but everything else was considered on set. Mm-hmm. And you know, we always made sure the place was clean, and we were able to change the loft a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, the first loft I moved in, like, that, it was a friend of a friend who was living there, and it was a bunch of guys living there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, somebody who had been there when they were there, and then after I took over and cleaned it up, it's like, wow, it used to be like living inside a testicle. Now this is like on stage. Did you say living inside a testicle? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I want to make sure I heard that right because yes. I also have three days of con brain. Yeah. And, you know, so that was my first loft space where, and I was really happy about that because it allowed me to uh, make some permanent changes to the site to make it more suitable for the game. Mm-hmm. You know, we painted it and set up uh, different... Um, you know, different areas, like, you know, we had a, a very Venture-like toy, uh, or toy or, like, library for them to be all stodgy in. Mm-hmm. And then, like, when I, but, like, when I did the Wedding of the Goblin King, mm-hmm. I was able to hang uh, grapes from the ceiling with fur on it. And so I would and, uh, do very, made it very much a fantasy castle. Mm-hmm. Like, I know that with some uh, places, okay, let me... Let me start again. Yeah. I imagine the scenario that you just described for some of our LARPers and some of our listeners Mm -hmm. is probably the most ideal scenario ever where you get to live where you LARP. Yeah. Because you have the space for it. Now, we hear some of the benefits of doing so, but what are some of the challenges of having that as your, your living space? Um. 
Well, one of the things is you make this commitment to this game. This game gets this space at these times. And so you have to ha- keep that schedule. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I can't move out of that schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I live my life around that schedule. Um, and one of the problems I had is not all the people that were roommates with there were copacetic with it. And it's like, you know, I had, I'd kind of have to nag people to keep this place clean because, you know, these people pay our rent, so we need to facilitate it for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, in my uh, late 20s, I was kid in the candy store. <laughs> I mean, I was playing in the vampire game. I was running the werewolf game. There was a mage game going on. We had a Star Wars descriptive game going on as well. Uh, so it was like I was having a blast. You, br- you mentioned the term descriptive game a couple of times. What does that mean? Um, I look at the kinds of... I just Basically, I divide LARPs between a descriptive game, which is where the action is described, mm. and then an active game. Like, you know, Dystopia Rising, where you're actually connecting with somebody, where you're doing buffer combat. So that's an active game. Oh, okay. So it is just alternative terms for, say, parlor and buffer. Right. Okay. It's, a, it's really interesting because, like, those terms are very... are more narrative-based. Yeah. I, the parlor game... Because it doesn't always fit the description of uh, you know vampire games like you know the one robot night game here I wouldn't call that a parlor game because we have this huge ballroom we sprawl out through the whole gardens and stuff mm-hmm. where you know I find that a limiting description personally yeah but at the same time it's interesting that you're using the word descriptive and you also are using the term active to mm-hmm. describe a game that is more physical mm-hmm. and yet someone could still argue well uh, some vampire players are very active in what they do. It's true. Mm. Now, you also mentioned earlier that one of the things that you think of for accessibility is when you write for games. Yeah. So, can you talk a little bit about how some of the spacing in a room gives you I guess more or less inspiration to write for that space? Yeah. um, Like... Dovetail was the last uh, par- or descriptive game mm. space, and having rooms that you can use because, like, you know, having one big room that means everything is on the table, and you have to make sure that what you're doing for that night, everyone is going to be involved in. Mm-hmm. Whereas, if you have smaller spaces, you can like you, know, this is what's going on here, and you can have different stages. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Firefly game. I run has uh, a bar area, which is mm-hmm. the in-character bar that people hang out in between mods, and then I have the main space that has that will decorate and change it from you know a space station to a shanty town, depending on what the you know, or hospital, you know, whatever they, I need for that scene. Mm-hmm. So that way, I've got places where not where everyone's not in a mod or in a story; they've got a place to hang out mm-hmm. and interact. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like kind of having available spaces like I have plans of uh, renting the DNA lounge for Firefly at some point oh wow okay that... um, I've, like, I've already made the preliminary arrangements as like I know how much it's going to cost and how much you know I, like they're wel- they would welcome me in you know I just haven't gotten like my uh, Firefly attendance has been a little bit lower of late Mm-hmm. Um, some, for some reason, my attendance dropped around October last year. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Zombie camp. <laughs> but it was interesting that you mentioned that uh, DNA lounge because I yeah. was just there Friday. So uh, that space is huge. It's huge. It's interesting. It has multiple layers. It's just a really cool. Uh, it's a really cool club site. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so DNA lounge, you have. Uh, a large main room with a uh, mezzanine around it. Mm-hmm. There is a second bar upstairs and a third bar in the back. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I like, you know, talking about space, and the reason why I bring this up is, you know, I, you know I've got my PC bar holding area mm-hmm. upstairs. Mm-hmm. I've got the main room, which I could do one mod or two mods in, mm-hmm. as well as a back room where I could, you know, have a three-ring circus LARP, which is, like, one of the reasons why I want to wait until... My attendance builds back up again because mm. that'd be a special, like you know, maybe the five-year anniversary of the game or something like that. Mm. 
or I think I missed the five years, so maybe the six year anniversary. But still, you know, like it's, it would be a special event game for Firefly. Mm-hmm. But like having that, I think I, I drool about having this space. You are literally drooling right now. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Not on the machinery. <laughs> <laughs> and just for reference, DNA Lounge is a space in San Francisco yes. because we it's an independent nightclub in San Francisco that's hosted everyone from Prince to um, uh, Amanda Palmer. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned a few pretty epic spaces that you've held LARPs in. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your favorite space? Um, can I tell you about the one that got away? Yeah, sure. So. Back when I was a uh, site manager for uh, Chicago Requiem, I was in the process and negotiated with the Chicago Theater. Mm-hmm. Now, if you've not seen the Chicago Theater, take a moment, Google it, look at the lobby of the Chicago Theater. It is a gorgeous theater made around the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. That was going to be my site for a vampire game. Holy cow. I caught it on a window between one show closing and the next show opening, so I could, like... It fit perfectly. Uh, it would have cost, I think, like twelve hundred dollars, mm-hmm. which is how much we ha- roughly how much we had in the game kitty at the time. Mm-hmm. And also remember, this was like two thousand, around two thousand, maybe ninety nine, two thousand two, somewhere in that area. Mm-hmm. So that's also thousand dollars went a little bit farther than <laughs> yes. And like right before I signed the contract, putting myself on the hook for that, mm-hmm. my game imploded. The staff issues. Um, not to, I, I'm trying to think of how I can put this in a succinct way. Uh, we had one member of staff that was problematic mm-hmm. with the uh, higher members of staff, and at the time there was the game was run by a group of people, and but there was also a company that was formed that was running it, but then it handed it off to the other, first group of people. And there's one person that was in both that kind of embezzled money from the corporation but was still running the game. And when they, when the, corporate, the company people said, all right, we need you out, they didn't talk with the people running the game at the time. And so they didn't, the people running the game didn't know what was wrong with the person and they defended him. And that wound up having the player base split mm-hmm. and I couldn't guarantee $1,200. Oh, wow. So basically... Staff issues. Yes. Staff issues is what we we call that. But wow, that's it's like that's that was my like my my Moby Dick whale that would have that got away. Oh no! But it also goes to show that uh, having a united staff is ridiculously important mm-hmm. to making sure the logistics run, and, especially for. In hind- the hindsight in this one is communication would have been key mm-hmm. if the party that was angry at the individual had talked to the second party that was defending the individual, I'm sure this wouldn't have had a problem, Mm -hmm. but they were kind of just, they acted. Mm -hmm. For a while, there was two Chicago games. Both one roll by night games. One was Chicago Requiem and one was Chicago Dark City. Oh, yeah, I remember that from a long time ago. And then a few years later, things got together and that's why it's Chicago Dark Requiem. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know too much. <laughs> you, it, so, it sounds like you've had a long, uh, entangled, almost incestuous history oh, with yeah. one world by night, and you have illegitimate children. <laughs> yes. Um, and I, you know, just as a side note, I really am grateful to one world by night. When I landed in San Francisco, uh, I spent the first night in the hostel with trying to come. I, basically, I came to San Francisco to be with the woman who wound up dumping me upon arrival. Oh my god! So and yeah. I just, and I would moved here from Osaka, mm-hmm. where I was teaching English, mm-hmm. and I second night show up at the One World game, and a uh, friend of mine, Jack, oh no, a player, Jack, who became my friend, put me up on his couch for six months, and that's how I survived my landing in San Francisco. So those, you know, Obi Wan has given me back some, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to have that kind of uh, community support in LARP. Yeah, I like, that is one of the big advantages to network LARPing is that you instantly have tribe wherever you go. Uh, one thing that I was surprised about yesterday when I 
uh, was playing in One World by Night. And again, keep in mind that I don't play in One World by Night very regularly mm-hmm. anymore. Part of it is because I do other LARPs. Yeah, <laughs> but so many LARPs. I need more weekends. I need, I need more weekends. I need more time. <laughs> but so... Uh, so One World by Night, at least for me and locally, has I just haven't been able to really uh, go. However, the nice part was coming to a convention, and shout out to Poizel for making sure that I had the hookup for my original Quajin character that I haven't really been playing, but I was able to play him at, yeah. um, at this game, and... I just wanted to play the character not necessarily to be really, really powerful or affect a lot of plot. I just wanted to be social and hang with a a few people that I haven't seen in a while. Now, granted, I haven't recognized a whole lot of people except that I haven't seen TJ in over 15 years. I Mm. realized that (laughs) when I saw her and I'm like, oh, my God. You know, but also there were friends of mine like my friend Heather who was in this beautiful Gangrel out oh, like yeah. fully just oh she, my god Prince She Who Burns Like the Sun is an amazing costume yeah Prince She Who Burns Like the Sun Prince Sunny Prince no. Soleil so, or Soleil <laughs> I, 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 I play her Seneschal and I am French so I'm trying to make everyone sound better <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like being able to like see old friends is is one of the reasons why I just wanted to do the LARP. Yeah, it's, uh, lo- that's what I love about, you know, convention games. Like, you know, here at Kublicon, this is the big West Coast event. Mm-hmm. You know, all the One World players come in and for this, uh, uh, that can, and just, like, seeing people is... Because we're all players. We're all gamers. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it's our tribe. It's mm-hmm. our group. We're all, we're all invested. Yeah. And I think a lot of it, too, is having a place is where you have that foundation for the mm-hmm. community. So it's why a, a topic like this, like for logistics, is really important. A couple of things that I keep thinking of is I know that Kai would have loved to be Oh, I wish this. Kai was here too. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I've been playing in Kai's game, and I met Kai through the game, and I love his dedication to the, this group and, and his sense of theater. It really speaks to... Cause, yeah, I have a bachelor's degree in theater. I am a theater kid. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, I say that the reason why I never became a professional actor is because I had my methadone of LARPing. <laughs> you, <laughs> you got the, you got, got the little cup. I got enough of a hit off of the LARPing that I never had the the, the starving drive to push myself farther. But I've also had a lot of fun with LARPing, so I'm not complaining. Not mm. complaining. Yeah, but also thinking about Kai's site. Yeah. Um, oh. At the Fort Ord. I drool about that site. Like airsoft. A base. It is, and I have said this repeatedly, probably one of the best sites, if not the best site I've ever been to for a game because mm-hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's immersive. Uh, if there's rain, <laughs> there's still places to play. There's still places to play, and you're inside of a two story barrack along other two story barracks. And so whenever things happen late at night and there's, and you know you're surrounded by all these zombies, or in this case, all of these, uh, like these brutal. Oh, the creep! He put he turns the creepy up to eleven. It's great. Yeah, when you have like brutal, like I guess police fascist force yeah. that will barricade you're... the doors. It, it is very very scary because you, there are not many places to run. You have to just either fight or die, or run into the darkness and get lost and right. die alone. But what's also great is that it is a five minute walk to Starbucks. Yeah, you. you that is the you, there's place. a mall within walking distance of the, this dystopian paradise. It's amazing. It is, yeah. Again, uh, the best I sites. went up to Uprise. Oh, okay. And they had an amazing location. Nice. No, it was a old like warehouse dock type place and as the presenter said this place is built on te- on tetanus so be careful <laughs> uh and one of the things like you know there was no uh no fighting by the tents unfortunately mm-hmm. which is one of the things that like at norcal game one of my best great fear moments in larp in the years of doing larp mm-hmm. i've had two really great moments and one of them was i'm sitting in a hammock with one body Waking up suddenly because something creepy is in our room. Mm-hmm. And I have that decision of do I call it out and help my friends do it or will they get me and I become a liability to my friends? Mm. 
unfortunately, somebody else called out. But it's like that adrenaline rush of waking up going, that is a creepy motherfucker five feet from me. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. I'm swearing on this. Swearing is totally fine. Okay. Fuck, 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 fuck. No. <laughs> I fucking forgot. <laughs> but, yeah, but that site I drool about. That is an amazing site. It's like, you know, it is probably too big for the Firefly game because my game is much smaller than Kai's. Mm-hmm. But someday. Because each building could be its own ship. <laughs> location, you know, the joke about location, location, location. Location is very important. Uh, the Bay Area is weird. There's a group of LARPers that will play out in the suburbs but won't come into the city. And there's a bunch of players in the city that just don't have the means. You know, there's a lot of city dwellers. Like, I don't own a car. I can't get out to half of these places on Walnut Creek without support. Mm-hmm. And so he's like... Uh, so that location, you know, access, when I talked about access earlier, there's just physical asset, access in the building, but then there's also public transportation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and parking is always a big, everyone always, you know, if I go, I want to be able to park and park safely. Mm-hmm. Do you want to invoke the city tax as people's cars get broken in? Mm-hmm. So let's play a little game here. Yeah. You have your choice of a site. Mm-hmm. Um, which rank in order the most important to least important food or a closeness to food bathrooms parking which is your top priority for your site my bias is bathrooms first Mm -hmm. food second parking third now I don't drive but (laughs) but now being that said is if you talk about parking slash public transportation Mm -hmm. I'll put that over food Mm-hmm. You know, like, if some place, like, uh, in San Francisco, you have the BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit. Mm-hmm. You know, I always try to find sure, make sure that locations are within a five, ten minute walk of a BART station. Mm-hmm. That becomes a higher priority than parking to me. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, with that, you could always park by Daly City or park by West Oakland and BART in and make a game. Mm-hmm. I guess for me, it's going to be parking. Mm-hmm bathrooms food because it, i guess for me like if you don't have enough places to park or yeah. um or at least if your site just isn't accessible to a lot of people it automatically limits the number of people who that's can true. play that's true um secondly will be bathrooms because uh, uh people are going to have some personal um issues and part of it is like the accessibility yeah. to a place where they can um, relieve themselves or even wash up if something happens. And food is a close, but close, food is nice, but it's not. That's, I mean, someone can bring food if right. they know that there's a site that's going to be away from places. In fact, most of the time, if we're camping, I'm not expecting them to have food. I'll bring the food myself. Right. But if a place doesn't have a bathroom, it, it, I do have to think about it twice. If it has parking. If it doesn't have a lot of parking, I'll go the first time, but I may not be bothered to go a right. second time. And also getting to the sites. Um, a lot of uh, buffer LARPs are are more remote spaces because that's where like campsites and stuff are. Right. You know, I've done a lot of Alliance, which is a fantasy buffer game. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a you know the San Francisco group that I've been playing with them for the years. Like my friend Warlock, he's the one who got me into it in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've had some amazing campsites that have had on been up on these mountainside dirt roads that mm. are like, you know, you're afraid to drive a goat through, let alone SUV full of people in camping gear. Did you say drive a goat through? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was reaching there. And then those sites, you know, there was Camp Cutter that we, that we went to for years, and it was one of those goat paths that were hard to get to. Mm-hmm. But the site itself was fun. There's a huge lodge. There's a lot of places to play, and we got to know it. But something happened with the management there that they were no longer maintaining it as well. And mm-hmm. like the new ranger in the space wasn't taking good play- care of it. And next thing you know, the lake uh, on the site was no longer having its churning device mm-hmm. so the mosquitoes got so bad that I refused to go back there and I was not the only one. Wow. You know, the general mm-hmm. manager is like, you know, the, twice we had the water stop working. There mm-hmm. was no potable water. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one time the kitchen didn't work. And it mm-hmm. had a full industrial kitchen that we'd used for years, but 
you know, there are plenty of campsites to find, but, you know, it's getting harder. I I really think the the more the climate goes, it's harder to find affordable places for games. Mm -hmm. When approaching any site to Mm -hmm. do a LARP, what are some things that they are either expecting to hear from you or what's information that you need to bring to them in order for them to qualify you to have the LARP at their site? So it, that depends. If um, Doing it now, I think LARP is a lot more, like the word term and that concept of LARP is a lot more common knowledge than it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. But it's still a lot of education you have to provide for people. Mm-hmm. Um when doing things for the buffer LARPs or active LARPs, uh, you know, a lot of the campsites and stuff like that, well, what's your insurance? And you need to make sure you are insured. You insure yourself walking to the site, uh, which is something that most descriptive LARPs I don't have to deal with. How does one acquire insurance for a LARP event? That I don't know. That is a Kai question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, table that one to when you, when you talk to Kai about it yeah. at some point because... Um, the Firefly LARP, I'm fortunate enough that my location insurance covers me. Okay. So I don't have to get insurance for Firefly because uh, I'm already covered with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's only a Sunday afternoon, I suppose, a weekend camping event. Yeah. Um, I wish uh, my friend Anthea is the general manager for Alliance. I wish we could have r- roped her into this. Or mm-hmm. uh, Oh, damn. Erin was here yesterday, too. Ah, timing. <laughs> <laughs> She's the assistant general manager for Alliance and goes through a lot of the pains of that and would be able to answer that insurance question better. Mm-hmm. But um, I've never I've never dealt with that side yet. Mm-hmm. Um, though I have an idea of trying to do something that would be a little bit more hit-and-run spaces, mm-hmm. basically talking to a commercial agent and seeing what it would take to get into some of the buildings that aren't you know, like, it's an empty office building. Mm-hmm. If we have insurance and we come in and clean up after ourselves, you know, that should be a plausible thing. What are some other things that site owners are looking for? Like, you mentioned, you mentioned insurance. You insurance. mentioned uh, um, the activity, like, I guess, being familiar with what a LARP is. Right. You know, like, a lot of times I will approach it with interactive theater. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, you know, I'm, I'm telling no lies in this one, but, you know, LARP is interactive theater. Mm-hmm. You you are both audience member and cast member at the same time, mm-hmm. and so with especially with descriptive LARPs, when I'm coming in office renting offices and uh, funeral homes, I haven't done again. I haven't gotten a funeral home in years. I haven't mm-hmm. even approached them in the San Francisco area. Mm-hmm. But um, is making sure that they honest, honest you know, you be honest with them mm-hmm. up front with them. Um, I was actually oh, another one that got away. Uh, for Firefly, mm-hmm. I was going to rent the USS Hood. I was that you the, mean the like ship, the aircraft carrier. Okay, oh my god! And I talked to the first person on it, and it's like I very much like we do simulated combat with Nerf weapons. Uh, looking at the prices of an overnight, or just you know, it's like, and they said, oh yeah, we have we have some you know cargo rooms that you would be able to use to set up your mods and stuff like that, and mm-hmm. then have the players. And then I was like, all right, all right. Then I went back to my player base, and it's like the overnight was going to be too expensive for them. Mm-hmm. So I was going to go back. It's like, all right, if we just do a Sunday afternoon and do a game, and then the second person I talked to is like, oh, you can't bring weapons on board. But I was very clear with what we do. To the last person, it's like, no, no, you can't do that here. And it's like, oh, not the one that got away. <laughs> could you imagine playing Firefly on an aircraft carrier? That would be, I, I can imagine, first of all, that would be amazing. Secondly, and, and playing anything on an aircraft <laughs> carrier yeah. would, be, would be worth it. It also sounds like cost is going to yeah. be a important factor that you definitely need to figure out uh, and then divided by... By your player base. Like, for example, the, uh, one of the problems with the hood is that if we were going to do overnight, there's going to be $100 plus every base for anyone that stayed overnight. Plus, so it wound up coming to about $200 a person for a special event game. Ooh, that's... Uh, but, that, but, but that would have been two days in an aircraft carrier playing Firefly. See... When you put it that way, <laughs> then it becomes something different. Sometimes you just kind of have to promote the package. I mean, I, I, I shared my enthusiasm and excitement about this idea with people, and there's some players like, I like the idea, I just can't afford it. 
Yeah. And so that's why it's like, all right, let's scale it back, see what we can do. Mm-hmm. That's why I hit the roadblock. <laughs> Maybe if I wait six months and try them again, somebody else will be administrative. Anyways. <laughs> what would be some of the key differences from, of, say, finding a site that you would have to do a LARP in uh, compared to a convention space that you so, are doing a LARP? So conventions... Um, I've done quite a few convention games as well. Uh, I like I have a, a descriptive superhero game that I run as a one shot. I've run I even run that one in Hawaii. Nice. Oh God, uh, uh, Comic Con Honolulu two years ago. I got to run some stuff there. That was a, that was fun. Um, it, and so that was the kind of game. So like uh, the Heroes League game I'm talking about. Um, I just needed a large room, and that was everything happened all in one place and uh, raw room, and I just it was all descriptive. Mm-hmm. Um, when Alliance was at did demos last year here, they were out in the garden, mm-hmm. and so they did their full armor and buffer and did buffer training and you know trying to introduce to new players. Mm-hmm. And so having again, it was you know just having large space mm-hmm. um, for. Uh, for the one world by game, one world by night game, um, we get this huge t- t- p- uh, p- pavilion tent mm-hmm. to play in, and as the se- the set dresser in me goes, "Oh God, we got to do something with this. This is too big a space." Mm-hmm. And so we bring up pop up tents, and we will divide the space up and use like fabric lines, you know, like uh, lines with fabric hanging them, so that way we have walls and it, and it is no longer just a big open space. But now we get a bit of a maze to play in. It totally works. Yeah, I've seen that improvement in this weekend, and it does feel like you still have that open space. But if you need a little bit of isolation, intimacy. you can have conspiracies happen in intimate spaces. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, conspiracy in one big open warehouse doesn't work as well. Uh, and this space also has this gorgeous gazebo on, when it's on the outside that's really nice to play in. Yeah. And we did the Malkavian meeting poolside because that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so it, well, it depends on your game. Like, you know, there are some one-shot LARPs that you can do in a, in a you know, like a bare box room. Mm-hmm. Um then the more elaborate stuff you you know you bring what set you can Mm -hmm. uh and decorate the space as you can uh you know the more interesting features of the space um so i've done i've done not necessarily a larp but i've done a nerf shooting gallery at a few conventions Mm -hmm. where i'll bring the set dressings from the firefly game and make a maze and just bring nerf guns and let people shoot each other no unattended children. <laughs> if you you can bring your child, but you're staying with. Mm-hmm. And that was just you know a shooting gallery, but it still makes a maze. That's the, you know the the tent maze to play in. It sounds like one of the things that also probably has to be in the site in the site guide is just what is the weapons policy on the yeah. site? Yes, because they're going to know that better than anyone. Especially, I do remember hearing the story of how. Just after nine eleven, all the security went up, so oh, yeah. you couldn't do like you couldn't do things like obviously no prop weapons, which there never really was in One World by Night. But there is a mechanic in Vampire which is called the bomb, yeah, and that they, got changed. That got changed because of the terrorist threat that was perceived by just saying that word. People were super paranoid about saying anything that was even remotely related to terrorism, so they changed it to the thumb. Yeah. And I think it's even still a convention now. Yeah. And as a result of history being history. What advice would you give to people who are searching for their own sites to run a LARP, aside uh, from all of the fabulous information <laughs> that you have just well, divulged? Or to sum some of that up, is that uh, definitely be honest but positive with what you're doing. Um, highlight, you know, the interactive theater is a good way to bring, introduce it to people. You know, like, we're playing soap opera. With superheroes, for for vampire's sake or werewolf's sake, you know, mm-hmm. um, make sure that you have enough space for your people to both gather and 
uh, d- hang out, disperse. Disperse. And disperse. <laughs> <laughs> to hang and also, like, you know, sneak around. Mm. Um, again, you know, accessibility both physically and also regionally, or locally, you know, parking and all that is important. Um, I always look at food as an icing issue, mm. meaning, you know, your cake is your space. And then food is a nice icing on top of it. it mm. It's not needed, but it's great when it's there. Mm. Um, and, you know, some some places you might need to jump through extra hoops and, you know, be comfortable with... You may not always get your favorite spi- s- spots. Mm. You know, be comfortable with the fact that you're going to get rejected. Mm. Oh, the Chicago Theater. Oh, the hood. Okay, for, so let's not kill you. Yeah. But it is time to wrap this up. Yeah. Before we go, I want to thank all of our listeners, but especially our Patreon supporters. Our Patreon is under Life Action Roleplay, of which Ryan is one of our supporters, so thank you. Yay! And so want to give shout-outs to Talon Bowler, Twin Mask Lurp. I need to make it down to Twin Mask someday. I keep hearing in pictures and the stories and stuff like that, but... I need another weekend in the month. I I, I understand. I mean, I, uh, Twin Mask sounds so much fun, but it's always like I've got a show that night. <laughs> uh, also, uh, to Treasure Kalafa, to Aaron Ludlow, to Vivid Vivka, and Sam Satchez, thank you so much you for, guys for your support. And so, Mr. Galliano, yes, where can p- people find you on um, the social medias? I am. Psycho Cat with a K on the Twitters. Uh, Blue Cat with a B L E U K A T on the Instas. Uh, K- uh, audience, do know it's B L E U. Because I'm French. I like French stuff. Uh, and the Barrier and Nerf Firefly LARP is a Facebook group. Uh, and it is Barrier and Nerf Firefly LARP. Mm-hmm. And I do most of the com- communication for the game through that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we generally play one Sunday a month in San Francisco, and I, it's a lot simpler game than Dystopia Rising, and I make it very easy for people to jump right in. Mm-hmm. You know, all damage, bullets do two, melee does one, period. No. Like, in more incentive to shoot oh. them up. Oh, I, I have to share one of my favorite rules for real quick. I, before sure. we get... Um, I have the dead to rights rule. Okay. Or the monologuing rule. Okay. Before combat has started, if I've got a gun with a nerf dart aimed at you, mm-hmm. and I call dead to rights, mm-hmm. regardless of how much health you have, regardless of how much armor you're wearing, if I hit you, you go to zero. Oh, okay. That way, I have a one P shooter, I can still stop you in monologue. Or, you know, dead to rights in a quick snapshot, and it's scary, but only once combat, before combat has started. So that way, like, you know, once bullets are flying, it doesn't matter. But if I get you with that first shot, Mm -hmm. it's serious. So what does that mechanic do for Firefly overall? What's the intended use? It it allows some dramatic scenes and monologues. You know, like, I've got a gun at you. Mm. Without this rule, two points of damage is not going to, you know, like, oh, I can scoff off two points of damage, and I'll just pull out my big rival and just mm. but I have a jolt with one dart and I call dead to rights you have to listen to me now mm. and we do have that dramatic villain monologue that happens wow or ho- hostage scenes now make sense because mm. otherwise without that mechanic you're just like oh shoot the hostage They'll, we can heal them. that interesting use of a mechanic that makes a lot of sense I'm very um, proud of that one. That was kind of mine. <laughs> Any other place where they can find um, you? I mean, obviously, Dystopia Rising NorCal. Yeah, I, I, I come up to NorCal. Camber salt was <laughs> Pinkertons. I, I'm the first Pinkerton on the podcast, aren't I? No, you're yeah. not. What other Pinkertons did you have on the podcast? Who did I miss? Uh, two podcasts ago, we had Ashley ah. Argel, who we were talking about LARP. And conventions, and she was great. I haven't caught up then. I'm not, I have been traveling a lot. That's well. To be fair, we are all recording this while at Kublicon. Okay, so. uh, okay. but still Pinkerton love. Um, and I also do a show once a month in San Francisco that is not LARP, but is a lot of fun. It is the Dirty Talk Game Show, which you can find at DirtyTalkGameShow.com. <laughs> wow. 
That, that sounds it, amazing. It is the best competitive sex talk you're going to find on stage. On that note, I'm going to do my social medias. This is Ryan Omega. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram under Ryan Omega. You can find me on Twitter under Ryan O-M-G-A. And you could find my show, my LARP show, on Scabby Rooster called Blank Slate, which mm-hmm. is the ongoing murder mystery now become more political intrigue uh, empire about to go to fall apart or war or something. And it depends on the agency of the players and the interactivity of the audience. So I'm very proud of that one. Okay, that's just... I have a whole other topic about streaming LARP logistics. Ah, oh, another time. Another time. Oh, yeah, because... But that's I, that's a whole kettle of fish. I have words. <laughs> I have so <laughs> sure many words on just setting up Blink Slate. It is not... It is surreal. Anyways... Before we go down another road... Before we go another road... Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you for coming on. Like, a, I, a lot of the things that you have said, I hope that people take your words and are inspired and not afraid to find their own spaces yes. for their own LARPs so that maybe they'll have their own communities yeah. one day. Uh, and uh, a, a stable LARP space helps build and helps attract new games, gamers. And, and it's, you know, the more it's there, you're like, oh, I may not make it this time, but it's interesting. And then if you're there long enough, they'll eventually get... And, you know, community centers are another good place to talk to. Park districts are a great place to talk to. Mm -hmm. Um, There are a lot of space. There's a lot of space out there. Mm -hmm. Just trying to connect it. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is that you can die from embarrassment. And then you know that there's now a funeral home that could be your LARP. (laughs) All right. With that note, bye. Bye. Thank you. And no, before I forget... Much love to Sin and Kai. I, I, I need to come back when all three of you are here. Like, this is this has to happen at some point. We yes. Will just, we will figure it out. I actually met Sin originally last year at KublaCon for the first time. Her oh. toy door and my toy door hit off real well. Oh, yeah. Like, she loved coming to KublaCon. Yeah. Then, you know, it's it's a shame that she just couldn't be yes. here or Kai couldn't be here. But more weekends. We need more weekends in the month. All of us. Yes, and we also need San Francisco and L.A. to suddenly be right next to each other. Bullet train! We need the bullet train! Shinkansen! We need the Shinkansen. Okay. All right, before we go on to something else, thank you very much. All right. Now, bye! Bye, Sam. Bye, Kai.